Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Westerling. I'm the Director of Public Works. And we are here tonight for a public informational meeting to be held by the Lake Maspinock Weed Management and Control Advisory Group. And before you is the group, we have the Chairman, Jamie Gonsalves, who is the Chairman. He's a member at large. Cynthia Estimer, who is the Vice Chairman, also a member at large. Eric Sonnet, who is representing the Parks and Recreation Commission. Jeffrey Barnes, who is representing the Conservation Commission and Drew Logan, who is also a member at large. And to, seated to my right is David Mitchell, who is a consultant working for the town. He's an aquatic ecologist and a certified lake manager. And with that, I'll turn it over to the chairman. Welcome to a meeting for the Lake Massapunk Weed Management and Control Advisory Group. Just call us the advisory group. Just, that's why we're here. We're pretty informal here. Um, right today, we're going to have a uh, pretty small presentation to discuss uh, different alternatives and uh, lay out um, the potential um, activities that may be involved with meat, weed management control and I'm going to hand that over to uh, Jeff who's going to handle that presentation. All right, well good evening everyone and thank you for coming out tonight um, and for participating. Um, it's an important part of this process. Uh, we really encourage uh, feedback and involvement from the community to help us formulate the plan. And we put a PowerPoint presentation together night, tonight that we'd like to go through with you. And I think the process will be, if you don't mind, you know, to let us run through the, uh, the actual presentation. And at that point, uh, when we're complete, we'll open up the floor to questions and feedback from the audience. Um, so the, uh, the group is the Lake Maspinock Aquatic Vegetation Control and Management Advisory Group. Uh, it's kind of funny because when uh, we first started meeting, we were referring to ourselves as the weed group, and we thought to ourselves, you know, maybe that's not the best uh, uh, name for the group. Uh, we might want to come up with something a little bit more formal. So the Aquatic Vege Vegetation Control Group is what we came up with. We didn't weren't sure what type of characters were going to show up if, uh, at these meetings if we <laughs> called it the weed group. So, um, at any rate, just to uh, kind of give some background, um, at 2015 at the town meeting, uh, there was an article that was presented for the funding of treatment of Lake Maspinock using uh, the herbicides that was proposed. Um, as most of you probably know, that was uh, the town voted against that. Um, the selectmen recommended that uh, we look at uh, form an advisory group um, to get together and really to come up with different, uh, you know, do an assessment and evaluation of the different options um, that were available to the town um, for the treatment of the weeds. Uh, it's a very pervasive problem. Uh, and, you know, as we all know, it's a very emotional issue. And the mission for us really is to look at the entire scope of the treatment options that are out there um, to ensure that what we're presenting to the community and what we're recommending to uh, John Westerling is fact-based um, and is going to be effective over the long term. So that was really what our mission is. Um, the, uh, as I said, the selectmen authorized the, adv the advisory group, and it consists of five volunteers who um, were introduced earlier. Um, so this is kind of right here on the first slide. We have the formal charge. The citizen input group shall make recommendations to the director of public works regarding measures to facilitate effective public participation in the formulation of the weed management and control plan. And again, you know, we're really here to emphasize that um, this is not driven by us. It's driven by the community. And again, feedback um, from the community and from the audience is, is really a, a key driver of this process. Uh, again, uh, uh, some of the key points here, ensuring that factual information regarding treatment options is communicated. Uh, coordinating, consulting, and providing methods and means for seeking public input, and then formulating methods and means of increasing public awareness about the benefits, the costs, and the potential 
the health and ecological risks associated with the plan that's, recommenda that's recommended. Uh, so what does this really mean? And we got a few bullet points up there. Uh, as I said, it's really finding a workable long-term solution to the nuisance weeds that are in the lake. Um, the group that's before you here really went into this with an open mind. We're not married to any particular treatment option. And we're really looking at, with uh, Mr. Mitchell's help, who's a certified lake biologist, looking at the options that are out there and, that, and what's going to be uh, effective. Um, and again, we want to keep the public well informed and we want to be transparent about the process and how we're coming up with this plan. A little background on the lake. Lake Maspinock is a great pond. What does that mean? It's recognized as a great pond by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And really what, that, what a great pond is, is it's a pond or lake that's held in trust by the state for public use, and it has to be greater than 10 acres. Uh, Maspinock is a, uh, comes from a Nipmuc dialect of the Eastern Algonquin, which is translated as the waters at the base of the Great Hill. Um, the, actual, the actual natural state of the pond is 30 to 40 acres, but because of the dam that was put in um, in the early 1900s, I believe, it's current actual size is about 234 acres. And the shoreline is shared by Hopkinton, Upton, and Milford. And the, uh, the Upton and Milford conservations were also uh, consulted on this process and basically they just deferred to um, the Hopkinton group, the advisory group and the conservation commission taking the lead on this. Um, when we come up with the treatment options, uh, we're going to present those to Milford and to the Upton Conservation Commissions, and then they'll ultimately have to vote on it as well. Um, so it is a, a process that all three towns are ultimately involved in. And this is just a uh, USGS uh, map of the lake. And just a couple uh, points there, 234 acres, approximately two miles long, 2,000 feet wide, its widest point. Uh, the watershed area is about 1,800 acres, which is fairly small for a lake of this size. Um, that's, the outflow is estimated at 28 cubic feet per second, and the hydraulic retention time, which is essentially the amount of time that the water uh, is latent within the lake. It's basically the turnover is about 260 days or an annual flushing rate of 1.4 exchanges per year. So the volume of the lake is actually flushed out about 1.4 times during the year. Uh, the average water depth is 8 feet, which is uh, really the, the shallow nature of the lake is one of the reasons why these weeds are such a nuisance problem and why they're proliferating so much. And this is a bathymetric map. Um, the lake's oriented the same way, and that's really just a fancy term for uh, how deep the pond is at certain locations. Um, the northern portion of the, of the lake, uh, which a lot of you probably witnessed, is, is fairly dry right now. That's more shallow than the southern portion, which is anywhere from 12 to 18 feet deep. And that portion of the lake um, uh, has not been dewatered at this point with the, uh, with the triannual uh, drawdown. Uh, we also have an aerial photograph uh, that was taken in January of the lake. And you can see the northern portion um, there that's been dewatered. And then there are some uh, of the uh, more known features so we have the West Main Street crossing at the top, um, the North Basin, Woody Island, Sandy Beach Island, and the outlet dam is on the southern end at the bottom of the screen there. So that really gives you a good idea, um, an aerial view of what portions of the lake um, have really been affected by the, uh, the drawdown this year. This is just a picture of the dam and the outlet. And then Lake Maspinock, water uses and issues. Um, Cynthia has taken the lead on putting a survey together uh, that's on the town website now. It was on Hop News. 
Um, and we're in the process right now of kind of collecting that data and taking a look at it. Um, and she'll speak to that in a few minutes. But really the major uses of the lake, uh, from what we found in talking with people, is swimming, boating, and fishing. Those are the three prevalent uh, recreational activities that, um, that people enjoy. And then hiking around the lake, obviously, is another one. Um, in terms of uh, the process uh, that we are using to come up with our different options, um, I'll get to that in a minute. Here's a, just a picture of the three really uh, prolific um, weeds that are invading the, the lake at this point. So there's the fanwort and the milfoil, which are non-native uh, invasive weeds. Um, and then there's the large leaf pond weed, which is really the past uh, year or two is what has really been a problem. Um, and interestingly, uh, the weeds have been a, a problem at Lake Maspinock since the 1970s. They've always been there. Um, the past couple of years, they've gotten really bad. But early on, it was really the fanwort and the milfoil that were problematic. And with some of the uh, lake management op uh, options that have been implemented over the past, um, say, decade, eight to 10 years, it's been very effective in uh, mitigating some of the fanwort and the milfoil in the lake. And what has happened because of that, those populations have been decreased fairly significantly. But what that has done is allowed the large leaf pond weed to come in and basically overtake the, the lake. Um, so the pond weed is, is really the big problem. Uh, the fanwort is, and, and the milfoil are secondary uh, weed issues with um, the fanwort uh, primarily being um, prevalent in the, the deeper parts of the lake in the south and the milfoil being more prevalent in the, in the shallow portions of the lake in the northern uh, part of the basin. Uh, this is just a graph that, that basically shows uh, where the different areas of the lake are and what types of uh, uh, weeds are uh, infecting those areas. Uh, the blue color is, I believe, areas that haven't been heavily impacted by weeds. I okay. Yes, yeah. Those are fairly shallow, more marshy areas. Okay, so there's uh, fairly uh, very shallow water up in that end of the, of, of the lake. Okay. That's across West Main Street, and on the north side of West Main Street, yeah. So in terms of our process for uh, evaluating and screening the different options, this is a flow chart um, that we put together uh, to, to basically go through how we're approaching uh, these issues. Um, and I'll go through each one of these separately on a, on a different slide, but it, it's really just to show you that this is a, um, it is a process. Uh, it's basically comprised of, of three phases. Um, it's a methodical approach we're taking, so um, it's, uh, it, with Mr. Mitchell's help, it's something that we're really looking at uh, very deeply, um, and we're really taking a hard look at what the different options are for the lake. Uh, right now, we're in phase one. Uh, phase two is the next portion of the project that we'll, we'll be undertaking, and this set of public meetings that we're holding right now is to basically make the public aware of uh, what conclusions we've um, come up with as part of the phase one uh, process. So phase one, consider all the possible methods and eliminate methods which are clearly not applicable or appropriate to Lake Maspinock. So in the scheme of all the different types of weed management techniques, uh, there are certain techniques that just aren't applicable to the lake because the water's too shallow, um, because of the type of weeds that are in the lake, uh, because of the, uh, the, the chemical, you know, the potential chemical reaction um, that the weeds would have if chemical treatment were to, be, um, were to be used as a treatment option. So going through the entire suite of different lake management um, 
treatment options, we were able to eliminate some of those as part of the screening process. And we'll go through that in a second here. As part of a, the, the phase one process, uh, really the, the first step we took was reviewing uh, previous studies of Lake Maspinock that have been conducted um, to date. And there have been three really major studies. There was one um, conducted back in 1979 by Jason Quartel and Associates. There was one conducted back in 1987 by Metcalf and Eddy, which was a fairly extensive study. And there was one conducted by Aquatic Controls Technology, which was a biosurvey bio conducted in 2008. And then Aquatic Control Technology has done a few periodic um, kind of update reports where they've come in and taken a look at what weeds were present in the lake, but those were fairly minor studies. Uh, so we did take a, the, the group researched those reports. We took a look at them. We looked at past recommendations in terms of treatment options. And we factored all these into our, uh, our phase one uh, evaluation. We also researched new approaches. Many of these studies are, are decades old. There are new techniques uh, that have been approved by the DEP and the EPA um, uh, over the past five and 10 years. So we, we also looked at those new technologies, such as hydro raking and those types of things. Uh, so those were all. Uh, some of the factors that went into um, our, our phase one study. And again, the technical support by Mr. Mitchell as well was key to uh, this phase one evaluation. So what were the, the lake management techniques that we looked at? Um, benthic barriers, uh, dredging, and surface covers and dyes were the three uh, initial ones that we looked at. Benthic barriers are basically when you go in and it's more geared towards areas where there's high activity, such as boat ramps, um, swimming areas, private docks, those types of things. And what they do is they come in and they actually put a mat in at the bottom of the lake on the uh, lake floor or the lake bed, and it basically prevents the weeds from coming up above the mat. So that's a fairly uh, uh, effective um, Technique, however, it's for smaller areas. So, you know, a lake-wide management, um, lake-wide management of the weeds, it's not, it's not really that effective. Uh, but it's nonetheless, we we kept it open as an option for potentially uh, treating areas or using it as an option for areas where there are high, high recreational activities, such as the boat ramps and and the swimming areas, as I said. Um, the sediment barrier uh, was a was a technique was a technique that we looked at, um, and it we just basically eliminated that because what that entails is is coming into the lake and basically putting a sediment layer on top of the lake floor, and it's just not uh, feasible or, or cost effective for a lake our size. So so that was eliminated as an option. In in terms of the dredging uh, options, the dry excavation. Uh, was eliminated uh, for basically two reasons. We can't fully um, drain the lake bays, and it's just not uh, uh, feasible to do that. Um, and secondarily, the cost associated with a dry excavation is just um, it's cost prohibitive. It's um, the 1987 report that was put together by Metcalf and Eddy. This was one of the recommendations that they came up with. Um, however, it had a, I think it was a 10 to $15 million price tag that was associated with that, um, and that was in 1987 dollars. Uh, so it's fairly expensive, and then you have to deal with the, the permitting of that, which is through the Conservation Commission, it's through the DEP, and then it's also through the Army Corps of Engineers. So there's a very comprehensive permitting process that you have to go through. Um, and you also have to... Uh, manage the material that's excavated. So that has to be disposed of properly, which is another cost on top of that. So it's a, it's a very expensive option. Um, wet dredging and hydraulic dredging are more uh, spot treatment techniques. So we kept those in um, as uh, you know, potential candidates for treatment going forward or management going forward. Um, but again, you know, I just want to emphasize that those are, are, are very expensive. Uh, surface covers and dyes, uh, basically what those management 
uh, concepts consist of is dyeing the lake. So you'd come in, um, I mentioned earlier that the shallow nature of the lake makes it uh, very conducive to weed growth and plant growth. Um, when you come in and you put a dye into the water, it basically prohibits the sun uh, from penetrating down to the lake bed um, and uh, allowing the plants to grow. So it, it, it helps to diminish some of the, the, uh, the weeds from growing in, in the lake. Uh, but it's just not cost effective due to the size. Uh, in terms of the surface covers, Again, that's where you come in and you put a cover on top of the water. You leave it there for a period of time. It prevents the sun from penetrating the water column and from the plants growing. Uh, it's just really, uh, you know, it's not doable for a lake our size. It wouldn't be effective. Mechanical harvesting, these are very popular techniques um, and are low to moderate cost uh, management. Um, options, we left all of those in as treatment options at this point. So they consist of the hand pulling or dive assisted removal, which is very labor intensive. Basically you have a dive crew, dive crew that goes in, scuba diving, and they hand pick the weeds out of the lake. Um, cutting, they come in, cutting with collection and cutting with no collection, they come in with actual mechanical devices that float on top of the water and they can basically cut the vegetation uh, that's a short-term measure, however, because you're cutting it, but the root system stays intact, so it eventually just ends up growing back. Uh, rototilling and hydro raking are techniques that uh, attack the root system of the plants. Rototilling is similar to what you would do in your garden, but you're doing it on the, on the lake floor. Um, hydro raking is where you come in with a rake uh, that's mounted on the bottom of a boat, and it's basically scouring the bottom of the lake bed trying to uproot some of the, the uh, vegetative root systems. Um, both of those are marginally effective. Uh, they have to be conducted um, on, a, on a routine basis three or four times per year for it really to be effective. Um, and uh, with the extent of the, uh, the, the weed problem at the lake, you know, you can imagine that that would be uh, very labor intensive. Um, and if you're doing it three, four, three or four times a year, the costs associated with that um, are going to be fairly high as well. Water level control, uh, the drawdown has actually been a technique um, that we've been using. Uh, I think it was initially permitted with the Conservation Commission back in 2008 or 2009. So we've been doing that for six or seven years. And essentially what the objective there is is that you draw down the water level in the lake during the fall and winter seasons. Um, it exposes the root system and the plants to the freezing conditions, uh, which does a uh, you know, fairly good job of minimizing the weeds. Um, and as I said, you know, that's been a fairly uh, effective uh, management option that we, that we have been um, conducting um, and will continue to do. Flooding is basically uh, when you come in and you increase the water volume uh, in the lake to increase the water column so that the sun can't get down to the lake bed uh, and uh, allow the plants to grow. And with, uh, with the lake our size, again, um, you know, it's something that I think this was actually one that we eliminated. Uh, just go to the next slide. Um, just because of the nature of the lake, it's, it's not practical. Um, there's a couple pictures of the lake uh, from this past year with our drawdown, and you can see that you know, this is particular. I think both of these are in the northern portion of the lake. You have the Sandy Beach boat ramp and the West Main Street public access. So those areas have been uh, significantly exposed uh, to the freezing conditions. And in fact, um, the Conservation Commission just extended uh, that permit for two weeks till February 1st because of the fairly warm weather that we've had in January. The hope was that you know we get a couple weeks of at least freezing conditions. Um, to help with the, um, uh, with the freezing of the root systems. And I think that has been, um, you know, we have had a couple weeks of fairly cold weather, so hopefully that'll be effective for this coming season. 
There's a couple more pictures <clears throat> to draw down. And then the chemical controls for aquatic weed management. Um, you know, again, as I said, we're not married to any of these options. We're just keeping all options out on the table right now. So, uh, you know, we thought that we would also look at the um, herbicide uh, management options as well. And a number of these were eliminated basically because uh, the chemicals that were eliminated um, just aren't targeted towards the types of plants um, that we're observing in the lake um, at this point in time. The ones that uh, were still opening, uh, are still open for consideration um, are specific to the three types of weeds um, and, and been effective in treating those types of weeds in, in the lake that we're seeing. And there's some biologic controls as well. Uh, some of these are a little bit crazy. Um, basically, a, uh, introducing herbace herbaceous fish into the lake, um, herbaceous insects. Uh, both of these have been done uh, in Massachusetts um, with some effect in this, but again, it's, it's very expensive. And then you're introducing um, uh, you know, new organisms into the lake environment. So, you know, that always uh, carries a little bit of risk with it. Uh, bacterial and viral pathogens, selective planting, and biomanipulation by stock fishing. Uh, so out of these uh, different control options, the one that we uh, elected to um, carry forward in our evaluation was the uh, herbo herbivorous insects. Uh, so that really gets us to where we are at this point in the process, just to, uh, to let you know uh, what this process is going to consist of going forward. Um, phase two is going to be a uh, more diligent and methodical um, and deep dive into the options that um, we're carrying forward. Um, we're going to look at those from a feasibility standpoint in terms of the size of the lake, the types of weeds that are out there, and the cost effectiveness. And then one of the other uh, you know, serious considerations that we're going to have to evaluate as well is the um, <clears throat> impact to uh, human health and environmental uh, the, the, the ecosystem. So those are also uh, key things that we're going to be looking at as part of our evaluation going forward. And the longevity is another, uh, is another one as well. You know, we want to make sure that we implement something that's going to be effective over the long term. It's not going to be a short-term solution. And again, these are just uh, these are the key factors. And combat compatibility with other options. So you know, right now we're doing the drawdown. We want to make sure whatever options we recommend to the DPW, um, they're going to work together and not going to be counterproductive. Phases three and four, uh, phase three, identify a suite of effective options and put together a lake-specific management plan to control the aquatic vegetation. And four will be to integrate the selection of the short-term control options with the longer-term watershed planning and management. And the goal there is a five-year plan. And again, um, just to reiterate, these recommendations will be put together um, with the public's feedback and we are going to be recommending those to the Department of Public Works and eventually they'll go to town meeting for a vote. So you know, we don't have the final say in actually what gets implemented um, as a, as a uh, management um, plan. The, the town ultimately makes that decision. We make a recommendation to the Department of Public Works. So here's a, just a couple key things that uh, that we've accomplished since we've been meeting in, I think it was October, and the group meets twice per month. Uh, so we invited, uh, some of you might be familiar with uh, Lake Kachichuit in Whalen. Uh, they basically underwent the same process that we're doing now, and we um, decided as a group that uh, it would make sense to have them come in, talk to us, uh, <coughs> learn about um, what lessons they found in the process, 
uh, learn about what they found to be effective, what wasn't effective, and what were um, good options for um, getting the public um, involved in the process. Uh, we conducted the phase one screening, which is what we uh, just reviewed, and then we have scheduled two public forums. Um, this is one of them, and the next one is February 22nd, which is a Saturday. I believe it's the 22nd. Mm -hmm. 27. 27th? 27th. 20, it's the 27th. And our next steps and timeline. Um, we'll continue to meet uh, biweekly, and we intend to uh, continue to evaluate the options and develop a long-term management plan for the weed control. Uh, there it is right there. Our next meeting is on the 27th at 10 o'clock at the town hall. And we plan on finalizing the management plan and when we do that, we will make copies available to the public. And we also intend to have uh, two more public meetings um, at that point when the management plan is, is put together. Again, we'll continue to pro provide updates and additional details. And again, we will have um, uh, we welcome your comments and feedback. We'll open this to the floor for questions in a minute. Um, but we have an online survey. We encourage you to, to take the survey so we can get feedback from everyone in the town. Um, you can reach out to Mr. Westling. Uh, if you go onto the town website, there's a weed management committee um, page that has our contact information. You can feel free to reach out to us. Um, and, uh, you know, the survey is on um, if you go to hopkintonmass.ma.gov it is right on the very um, top of the of the home page which is is great that it's so easily accessible there i think it's on one of the slides you may have gone past yes. if you go back about four slides um Oh, uh, right there. there. There it is at the bottom. We also have paper copies on the table behind you, as well as, I'll just mention, Jeff, the comment forms there, too. So um, if you have a thought that we don't get to for any reason, please jot it down, because we do want to consider everything. Yeah, at this point, I'll open up the floor to any questions. I think if you could step up to the podium, it might yes. help for... Yeah, please step to the podium and, and give us your name and address, please, for the record. Thank you. Malcolm Page, 74 Pine Island Road. Uh, when do you expect to make your recommendation to Mr. Westerling? And at that point, once you make the recommendation, you were going to have two more public forums or meetings? Correct. Uh, we anticipate uh, making those recommendations um, later on in the spring, I would say probably around April. All right. And if you do make a recommendation that they want to pursue, is there going to be something that has to be put on the town meeting warrant, or, or is it trying for this year or next year, or what is the timing on that? Uh, I believe it will have to be put on town warrant. Yes, anything that requires funding will have to have town meeting approval. And what is the deadline on the, uh, is it 30 days before that you have to submit? I'm not sure what that time frame is, but the time frame is, has been published. Uh, and if there are any recommendations to come forward that do require funding, we'll be sure to meet that time frame. All right, but I know that town, I think, is, for citizens, is it March 2nd? Something that... I don't know. Oh, yeah, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I think it is, yeah. But I think I, I the, believe, town, the town has additional times to come up right, with the Right, I understand that. I was just wondering what that deadline was and whether we're trying to meet that deadline. We can, we can definitely meet. We're going to try to meet that deadline as it stands right now. Okay. Thank you. Any comments regarding any of the technologies that you guys saw? Any recommendations? Any, any, any thoughts? Hi, it's Hanan Cohen, 31 West Elm Street. Um, you sounded very adamant about the drawback process, and uh, you made sure that we understand that it's going to continue. Uh, 
The, do the you draw, have, you're talking about the drawdown. The drawdown. It's drawdown. It's okay. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, do you have any measurements as to the effectivity of this process? Uh, since you started it, I think it's 2008 or whatever, or 2009, um, do you have any idea how effective this process was? Because I think we need to take under consideration the impact on the citizens that lives around the lake, wildlife, uh, even property value. So um, it seems like it's a uni unilateral decision that was made to drop down water without taking under consideration some impact on the residents that live around the lake. The drawdown that's occurred this year is probably, this is the first year I believe that we've actually been able to achieve the levels that we've achieved just because of weather and other circumstances that have happened in the past. Um, the annual drawdown is not only for weed control, but it also allows uh, residents around the lake to do other repairs on boats and bulkheads and such that um, that they have. They can pull out the boats from the lake. I don't need to but suffer. Dock, <laughs> but the docks themselves and that kind of yeah. thing do need repair and such. So yeah. there is there is that 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 goes on. But the, the, the triannual every three years, we do attempt to make this large. It's been taking place for, the, I think, a few years now, not I've, too I've been living ago. in this address for since about 2009. Uh, there is totally inconsistent between the drawdown levels. So one year, it's almost non-significant. One year, it's completely dry. I'm not talking about this year. This year was very... Uh, significant and I understand that but through the years since 2009 it's very inconsistent so it seems like it's there is no method to to the levels but I guess with discussing with, with discussing sir with discussing with other committee that uh, I put my issues in front of them so they said that there is some uh, uh, management about the levels uh, the question here is um, if, if you have some issues with, you know, every year with allowing people to fix boats and, and dogs, the part that is really not suffering from this issue, it's our part, and I'm not sure if you can put the, the map up there, but it's sort of after the main street, beyond the main West street, Hill. West Elm. Um, it doesn't look like it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's the upper side there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look like the, it's the same impact for those residents to the residents that lives in the main lake. Okay, the main lake usually stays somewhat full. Not this year, but usually in this year it's somewhat full. But this time, this uh, area over there, it's always really dry. So I was wondering if there is any way to somewhat, you know, balance the two things. Unfortunately, there's not. Just the, uh, the depth up in the northern part of the lake is a lot shallower and a higher elevation. So when you drain it, um, you know, the water moves south. Um, so unfortunately, when you, uh, when you drain the lake, you're not going to be able to um, pick and choose, you know, the, the portions of the lake that are going to remain, uh, that are going to be drained and are going to remain, uh, you know, at their normal conditions <coughs> or semi-normal conditions. Um, in terms of the drawdown, it does vary from year to year, and that's basically because, um, you know, we do have a targeted uh, uh, range that we try to get the lake drawn down to. Um, annually, it's between two and four feet, um, but that's dependent on rainfall. You know, so if you get a lot of precipitation a certain year, um, you're not going to get as much drawdown um, as you would if you had in a, a year where there were drought conditions, for example. Um, and the, in, in terms of this year, the reason that that whole northern area is exposed is because it was, um, it was twofold. It's, you know, we are in drought conditions right now, and then this was uh, uh, the third year, so we do the triannual um, drawdown where we extend it to 8 to 10 feet below its normal levels. And the objective there is really to, um, to target the weeds, you know, and to really get those root areas exposed so they can get into a deep freeze and, 
you know, we eliminate the problem. But is it working? Try to Do you have it. some data that shows that it's part working? Of, part of the comprehensive plan that we want to move forward will track data better. Okay. Um, looking back to all the way to the 70s and 80s, some of some of the reports are, are spotty. It's done for a while. So you don't have the data. So right now I cannot I cannot actually see the benefits of the drawback and the history of it as well. No, I, at this point in time, I cannot see any benefits from that. That's not exactly true. Okay. When you say wiped out, is it is it? It's, it's data. Okay, we, I'm 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 an engineer. I'm looking at data. Okay, so so the question we're, here: Do we have do we have data? We do have we, we have surveys. Mm -hmm. We have we have surveys. We have weed surveys that were conducted that show that the the invasive species were brought into control, and the non the and the the. Non-invasive, non the nuisance weeds. The, the non-invasive species, because there was a void in that in that niche in the environment, has taken over and it's So invasive. essentially, what what I'm trying to get. So after this major drawback this year, you anticipate that sometime around down the line in this year, we will be able to see some data that will show we started January 2016 with this amount of weed per square meter per square inch or whatever and after the drawback we are less true we plan on doing continue to do surveys and evaluating all the techniques that have that are going to no, be I, I'm, I'm just saying i'm i'm currently and the reason why i'm a little sounds a little bit frustrated because i'm currently going through some sort of uh, you know impact on my quality of life. I'm looking at the lake, it's dry, it's ugly. I'm seeing at the ducks, they're really not happy with, without water and so forth. So my quality of life is impacted. So I don't mind suffer, okay, as long as I see some results. Okay, so if you can actually provide some we, results. We will, we will continue to do surveys and we will try to get that information. Again, this is a work in progress. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to play along with the progress. One, right. one other point to understand is that we can't do any drawdowns without the approval of the Conservation Commission. So we did go before the Conservation Commission. Yeah, I talked to them too. And received their approval for the extended drawdown this year. Yeah, but they also could not provide me any data that those drawdowns are working. Okay, so yes, there is. it's a great idea. It's very easy. It doesn't cost anything, all right? So, hey, why not? Let's close the tab and that's it. We're done. So we feel we're doing something, but actually, do we have data that it's actually doing something? Well, I'm, I'm on the conservation. We're going to let our, our, our uh, David Mitchell uh, uh, meet that. No, I that. just need to say Thank that, you know, the map we showed on slide 13, if we can go back to slide 13, slide 13, yeah, is actually a map of what every year they go, you want to go next, that would stop. So you see, that is actually, they've got several versions of that over the years. Yes. And that's how you look in terms of the combination of both the species types. Mm -hmm. and then, I know this is a very small uh, legend, but it actually does provide information as where the plants are, what has been eliminated or brought down. So we do have, there is some data. So well, the, the, we provide that to you, um, I'm sure. They're, they're the data that I'm looking for is the drawdown. Okay, so we started the year at this situation. After the drawdown, we fill up the, the, the lake again, and here we had some success. Well, the time you would be comparison is probably from mid-summer to mid-summer. Okay, and, and we sounds can good. We started it at 2008. We started it at 2008, so we have um, ample years to sort of gather gather the data, right, from 2000 year to two, 2008 to 2016. We probably have about three maps. Coming up with actually the data for this is not a trivial. Yeah, I'm this sure. Is, so I'm first, sure. Can I just, so on the Lake Mastodon website, actually all these surveys are posted. Yes. There's actually some, um, some comments in there as well from ACT that will uh, talk uh, about the effects of the drawdown. 
So I think if you take a look at the, at the uh, association website, you'll find it. I, I, I looked, and trust me, I did a, a major research before I, I went to the committee here. Uh, and nowhere to be found is an actual factual data that shows comparisons, okay, between what it used to be and what it is now and what this process actually achieved. Maybe I missed it. I don't know. Can, can you direct me where it is? It uh, should be on the website. Okay. But then we tried to do another drawdown three years later, and we were, we were not successful. And we only got down maybe five feet. So what we did this year, we accelerated the, uh, the drawdown one year earlier. And this was the first year that we were ever able to, uh, to get it down to eight feet. Um, in September, we did a biological study, again funded by the Lake National Preservation Association. We have that data. If we do another study this summer, we'll be able to have comparative data again. Perfect. So that'll be two, two drawdowns Perfect. if we have comparative data. Today. Perfect. So it does exist. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Don Kaiser, Oakhurst Road. Um, a couple of things I didn't see here. One, I know that there was some sort of plan for aeration that was proposed to us uh, last spring. I saw no information about that. I don't know if it was a viable option or not. You may have just nixed it and not even dealt with it at all, but it probably should have been in your presentation. I was curious about it. I wasn't trusting it. I didn't know whether it would work or not. Um, the other thing that should be, really should be part of the plan is that I'm kind of in favor of the dry dredging. I was discouraged that you just threw that out. It's been recommended before. And if you don't get the nutrients off the bottom of the lake, the muck, it seems we're always going to have a weed problem, no matter what kind of options we do if we don't get rid of the nutrients. And the second component of that is there's nothing in the plan to stop the continuing nutrient loading. We have storm runoff from the roads. We've got my neighborhood now has a dozen people that use Chemlon on their yards. If there are towns that can ban plastic bags, damn it, this town could ban <clears throat> fertilizers around the lake. That's very doable. And we still have septic systems. You know, is there any, you know, in Upton, Milford, Ark Road, there's places that still have septic systems. Are they nutrient loading? Um, so those are still concerns, and I think we really need to figure out how to get rid of the muck. And it's not easy, it's not cheap, but, you know, if we don't do that, then we're just going to be continuing to try to do things that are more like Band-Aids. And that's my concern. And I'm glad you're all doing this work. Thanks. Um, just a couple things. I think we will take a look at aeration again to see. I'm not sure exactly why that dropped off or... If it, it was primarily um, works with algae, right? It's I knew there was a, a reason why we looked at it, but I wasn't sure if it actually got yeah. next thought. Um, the dry dredging was was basically because of a cost issue with the both the permitting and the long term process that that would that would entail, as well as the disposal, disposal uh, yeah. of the and the nature of getting it in there and doing a, a complete removal like that. So that was the. I think those were the two main portions and reasons why that was uh, initially removed from the from the list as an option. There was one more uh, reason. We, as a lake association, started to do the uh, dissolved oxygen levels. We did testing for that, and it was found that the oxygen levels are very good in the lake, so the aeration would add very little to, to the, uh, the process. That is correct. I mean, right now we do have. Um, We've, as part of the in one of our first meetings, we had Dave um, look at an overall view of what the water quality was for our lake, and um, in general, we have a very high, a very good quality uh, water in, in our lake right now, and we, as a group, wanted to make sure that whatever methods, method or methods that we selected, that wasn't going to get impacted, 
and um, so that was one of the one of our main uh, focuses at the initial part of it. So, and in, in terms of the, you know, I I agree with you. The, you know, there are lawns around the lake that are being fertilized. Um, you know, the conservation commission uh, does the best we can in terms of when there's new construction, you know, the, as part of the order of conditions, we have a condition in there that they have to use environmentally friendly fertilizers um, and pesticides, chemicals. Um, it's just a, it's a hard thing to enforce. Um, so uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the nutrient loading of Lake Maspinock, it's actually has a fairly good nutrient concentration in the lake. It's not, um, when, you, when you look at the studies that have been done, um, you know, it's, family, it's, it's fairly average and normal for a lake. So it's not getting a lot of excess nutrients um, and there isn't, uh, um, there isn't a, an excessive amount because of the runoff coming in from the streets and from the septic systems and from the, the fertilizers. Um, I will say that the weeds are, you know, a function of a number of things. Um, one of them is the nutrient loading in the lake. Um, another one is the depth, um, which is, you know, a situation where, such as our lake, where you have fairly shallow depths, um, the sun can easily penetrate, you know, especially with a, a lake like, like ours where the water clarity is, is very good. The sun can get down to the lake bed and actually encourage the, the growth of the, of the weeds. Um, and unfortunately, when you have a shallow lake with the, like, like ours, um, it's going to continue to be a problem. We're never going to be able to eliminate it. Um, the other factor is the silt in the bottom of the lake. Silts are very conducive to weed growth because the root, system, root systems can take very easily. Um, the seed pods and the fragmentation, when that happens, um, you know, the seeds and the fragmented weeds fall to the bottom and they can easily establish themselves in a, in a lake bottom that consists of silts and sediments. Um, you know, that's another contributor. So um, I guess the point is, is I think there is more that we can do um, to help with the nutrient loading. I, I don't, and, you know, in my view and from my experience on the Conservation Commission, um, you know, I'd like to try to continue to uh, work towards minimizing it, but it's not a main contributor um, to the problem at this point is, I guess, what I'm saying. But I think uh, one of the things that whatever recommendations that we do come up with, we will look at um, not just um, techniques to actually do uh, things on the lake, where there may be other um, suggestions and uh, things to implement regarding um, communication to the residents around the lake regarding their fertilizer use and uh, also uh, encouraging um, the other residents of the other towns um, that don't have septic, that don't have sewage but have septic systems um, maybe finding a way to see if we can make um, move that process along for the, for those for the towns as well so that may be part of the recommendation as well those are very good points. The public education piece is, is really key to anything uh, being sustained moving forward. And we've, uh, we've done some looking into things around the lake. And it's interesting to see that before public sewer came down into that neighborhood, uh, there was a lot of nutrient loading. Um, and one can see that we've had great improvement there. Um, and I've been told by our limnologists that septic systems are, are better than ever um, and seem to be leaching less in. However, the kind of vigilance um, in being educated, self-educated, um, so that we, we know what we're talking about and what to talk about amongst our neighbors and friends, I think is, is all very helpful. Any other questions, comments? I do have one comment. Uh, <clears throat> why don't you come to the mic? Oh, oh, for there is. Data that if you're looking for, the yeah. uh, Association has tested the water for many years and we've posted phosphorus uh, levels. Uh, this year, as I said, we started the dissolved oxygen. We also have the clarity 
um, and then looking for any nitrates or whatever in the water. We've done that for a very, I'm, I'm probably about 20 years. In addition, uh, about five years ago, we upped that and we test three times a year, spring, summer, and uh, fall in three different parts That's of the water world. quality. Water quality. And phosphorus is one of the tests that we have done and the phosphorus levels, surprisingly, we all thought they were gonna be higher. Uh, they've consistently been well within a normal range. And that's on the LMPA. Thank you. Hi, Carol Esler, Oakhurst Road. Um, I just want to say thank you for your thoroughness. Good stuff. Um, but um, this is more of a comment. Um, I've lived on the lake for 32 years, and um, I think we can be very um, human centric. And as far as I'm concerned, I get really excited when um, I hear a bullfrog again, which I used to hear in the early years. And I want to make sure that we're managing our lake for biodiversity and for the overall health of the ecosystem and not for human convenience. So I just want to throw that concern out that it should be about the overall health of our environment. So thank you. That, that is one of the uh, factors that we're taking into consideration is the human health and the ecological risks. So that, that is a consideration that we're... Well, that's true. The studies involve the drawdowns and whatever with the Corps of Engineers and the state really look at the whole long run, the whole floodplain of the lake and how it affects it. It's implemented by our Conservation Commission, but it's a broad base uh, look at the whole ecosystem. One comment I will make though, if you if you want, are so inclined and want to get more in depth, there is a, a, um, a document put out by the state that has a generic, it's called the Generic Environmental Impact Report for weed control. Uh, I'm not sure exactly well, on the exact title, but if you go on the DEP website, I'm sure you can download it, it's about 350 pages. Mm -hmm. and goes through every single technique that we've already discussed. It talks about, um, you know, what it's used for, what its effectiveness is, what all the different uh, available uh, and approved uh, herbicides and what they're targeted towards and what, they're, what, the, what range of, of applications and uses that are, that are available. So <clears throat> if you want to become a, a proficient in that, that's where you'd find it. Mm -hmm. We'll assemble um, a good list, and certainly that gear report will be top of it, yep. but um, the clear so lake. There's two big forms. One is the generic environmental impact statement, which up until that time was 2004, pretty much looked at all the lake management uh, controls for algal um, control eutrophication as well as weed management. And it's about 670 pages, and now they look at the map, they look in that. They also have a companion piece, which I would recommend more, is more pra called the practical guide. Practical guide is only 200, but it goes through each of the individual uh, methods and goes through a very concise, usually two or three pages, pros and cons. It was kind of designed to help conservation commissions, you know, who are not familiar with this stuff, kind of quickly come to grasp what the issues were, what you should be able to do if you're going to do this uh, application, and, and what kinds of things you need to, pr to protect the environment. <coughs> So both of those, and you're right, we should probably come mm -hmm. up with a resource we will, yeah. that can provide that. Almost, we almost done, yes. almost ready. <laughs> That's currently on the Lake Association website, too, if somebody yeah. wanted to go there. It's on the DEP. I mean, it's yeah. pretty downloadable. Yeah. If you're the, really the, link is, the, li the link to the DEP <laughs> website. I think it's the link to the DEP website? Yeah. Yes, yeah. good. So. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I think I'll just comment on the survey in that it, it taps in with um, your comment, Carol. Um, the survey results that have come in so far, we've got about 90 results. It's been out for 10 days. Um, we'll keep it out and uh, the <coughs> comments and responses coming in, but we were looking at late use. We were trying very hard to get the sense of 
who uses the lake and for what reasons so that we know that that'll impact what our recommendations will be. Um, and I just wanted to make note that uh, the primary uses seem to be for swimming and canoeing and kayaking and more passive enjoyment of the lake uh, than motorboating. And to my surprise, the water skiing and jet skis are snowmobiles or ATVs, that kind of motorized use was much lower percent of uh, the responders. So I'm pleased to see that folks um, enjoy the lake just for the lake's sake and not necessarily being in it or on it as well. Quite a few fishermen. Lots of fishermen. Can I ask, was that mostly a survey of Hopkinton residents or all cities? Hopkinton residents. Okay, so that's how much of the, of the percentage of the lake is that? Um, it's the largest percentage, um, but is there a question under the I'm question? I'm curious about how much of that, because we're representing all three towns, if I'm not correct, but we're probably just surveying Hopkinton. Very little in Milford. Yes. Yep. Hopkinton has a bigger share. Yes. But yes. it all is uh, south of the uh, uh, area with nothing on the Peppercorn Hill. A lot of conservation. Mm -hmm. So it's yes. just that concentration. It's probably only, only maybe 10 houses in Milford. I just think that's really a perspective that we want to keep highly in mind is that we're representing other portions of the lake as well that are not only Hopkinton residents. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. I know each time it still owes us 33 cents for <laughs> the purchase of the Exactly. <laughs> Anything else? Questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming. You. Encourage your friends and your neighbors to participate. It would be helpful. Second word. All in favor? Aye. 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 Should have announced donuts for the 27th on Saturday. We will. <laughs> we will do that. <laughs>